Hi, this is Stephanie Pruitt. It is day six of 30 by 30 by 30, where I'm writing 30 poems in 30 days in relation to works in the 30 Americans exhibit at the Frist Center for the Visual Arts in Nashville, Tennessee. Today, I drafted a poem in relation to a series of watercolor drawings and paintings by Nina Chanel Abney. Um, Nina Chanel Abney was born in Chicago, Illinois, 1982. She's working out of New York, and um, this work is entitled Untitled. It is 25, um, again, watercolor drawings. There is a whole scene, a clear narrative, of, well, I don't know about clear, but it's a narrative of people seemingly kind of battling demons, maybe internal and external. There are a lot of symbols that I was working through. Um, Abney seems interested in the idea of yellow hands or maybe yellow gloves, those utilitarian kind of yellow gloves, hearts, um, lightning bolts, or some type of like power transfer. Um, there's a green monster that appears in several of the several of, several of the 25 works. So there's some system of symbols that I'm really interested in. But overall, a lot of the drawings, it seems like something challenging or kind of socially and personally um, negative or even horrific is happening, but it's all done in this comic type form, whether it's the use of primary colors or just the, the way they're drawn, they look as though they're comic style drawings, but obviously content wise, they're not. And that felt quite familiar to me. It's seeing the beauty in the pain. It's the, the art, whether it's music, visual art, poetry, that's depicting a rather horrific scene, but done in a way visually or orally that seems a bit easier for us to take in. So let me read the short draft and then I'll talk a little bit about the process and the experience today, which was pretty interesting. The green ghoul shadowing our own murderous acts. The blazing stare that keels. Yellow hands waiting to smack. The striking bolt. The puppet pulling its strings around your neck. How horror is metered in comic form. It's the spoon of sugar with turpentine poured all over. That last image, the idea of, of sugar with turpentine, really brings me back to my grandmother who had many, many ways to cure the common cold and the uncommon colds. And it, she was one of those make a way out of no way women. And that can feel like a very familiar trope in the African American experience. It's not every black person's experience that you have to make a way out of no way being a sharecropping you know, woman with 10 children in Mississippi. That feels like something that we want to see in black people's lives, but it's not the, it's not the case for everyone. However, it was my grandmother's life. And you know, turpentine with some sugar, that was, a, that was medicine. And not something I would give my daughter today, but there is something amazing to me about taking something that seems deadly dangerous, horrific, and putting an edge on it that makes it more palatable. But this happens in a lot of ways in people's lives. For instance, I recognize that there's something about me for many people that's accessible, um, easy to approach, and palatable, whereas other, and let me tell you, I know I'm stepping on all kinds of landmines here, but let me just say this. Black people are scary to some people. Newsflash, right? It's not, a, it's not the black person's issue until, of course, you're like applying for a job or wanting to get credit. It's really a reflection on other people and their narrow concept of, of who a whole people can be, that whole range of people. But I know there are things about me that make me approachable quite often. I'm an explorer, so I'm curious about ideas and conversations. So a comment or a question that might offend other people, it offends me down the line. It takes 15 or 20 minutes for me to offend, be offended by it. Initially, I'm curious and I want to explore and talk about it. Um, other things about me, I know the way that I dress, the way I carry myself, the idea of passing through clothing, I think is really interesting to me. There's a, an essay being circulated right now talking about those dumb poor people. And I, I can't remember the exact title, I'm butchering it, so please don't hold me to this. But it's something to the effect of, how a lot of times we want to kind of poo-poo on people who we think are in a lower economic class and they buy certain shoes or clothes or purses or cars and we think that's a really ignorant thing to do but 
This essay explores the idea of potentially passing and raising your social status by being palatable and appearing to fit in with other people and how if done strategically, it can make sense. I won't go into the whole merits of that personal essay. It really is an interesting one to read, but I do recognize that you know, when you look at me in the way I dress, some people will feel, oh, I'm one of the exceptional black people. I'm one of the palatable, comfortable ones. Let's talk to her about this. So actually today, after I walked through the 30 Americans exhibit, um, there's a really interesting stand of yellow post-it notes where people can write their reactions and questions or ideas after viewing the show. And I was writing at that little station and a gentleman walked up to me and said, may I ask you a question? And I'm, you know, already red lights are slightly swirling. I know what this can potentially be after walking through an exhibit like this. But he did ask, and I said yes. In another mood, in another place, I might have said no because I didn't want to be the ask a black person, you know, day. Maybe I didn't want that. But I was very open to this experience. I said yes, and he said, he asked me why the church was not more of didn't have more of a presence in this exhibit because from all that he knew in, in studying culture, the church had been a major, major element of the black experience in America and it bothered him that the church was not a, more prevalent or prominent in the exhibit. Wow. So this is, this is, there's so much swirling in my hair right now and I feel like I'm going to talk too fast trying to get it all in. So there are our expectations of what black culture or any culture or people or experience might be. And I think it's important for us to look at where those expectations are created and built. Maybe it's palatable, maybe it's comfortable to put the church, and I say the church almost again with air quotes because there is no singular church that has affected black people's lives in America. There are many churches, spiritual institutions, and a whole myriad of other places that have affected the cultural and historical and social and spiritual experience of people in this country. So that's my first thing. But what I heard in his question was, from all that I've seen, from all that I've read, from all that I've experienced and understood, this has been a major issue in the whole narrative that you know, we're dealing with in this exhibit, so why isn't it visible? Part of my answer to him, and we ended up having a whole conversation that was really amazing, so I'm gonna say hello to Rick, and I'm really glad that we did talk about this. Part of what I said is that hopefully, we engage with artwork, we come to exhibitions like this to see something new and different, to recognize and engage with elements of a narrative that maybe we haven't seen so often. I also challenged him to walk through the exhibit again and look for elements of the church that he might not have immediately recognized. Maybe it wasn't, you know, the choir in their robes with their, you know, faces towards God singing. Maybe it wasn't Jesus on the cross, but what are other ways that the church can present itself? Um, present itself. I also challenged him to think about why it was so important to him to see that element of the narrative. Why for him to be comfortable, you know, why, why did he need to see the church to be comfortable feeling like he had engaged with a black experience? I don't know that there's a complete right or wrong. My, my colleagues and my friends who, who study culture and sociology and, you know, other areas, I'm sure you have so much more to say on this. But I absolutely counted this day a success and I counted this exhibition a success by having that conversation with Rick and knowing that it was bringing up the questions. My fear and my, well not fear, it's not a fear, it's not my issue, but my concern and the reality is not everybody has a miscellaneous black woman who's accessible to talk to them about these things. And I think it's easy for some of us to be complacent in exploring the realities beyond the image we see. And by that, I mean, if you're curious about an element of a culture that is not your own, where do you get your information? And this isn't a reflection on, solely on the person I was talking with today, but just in general, I think it's very easy to be knowledgeable about the majority culture because everywhere we go, billboards, magazines, television shows, movies, there's so many lines of that narrative being told. Whereas with a minority narrative, with and there's no single narrative, which is really the point I'm making, 
how do people every day really learn about the wealth of the experience, not the single story that's being perpetuated? There is a book out, and again, I know I'm going to butcher the title, but it's something like Ask a Black Person, or, you know, the whole concept is people say, oh, I'm not racist, I have a black friend. And presumably this one black friend who's circulating among all people is answering their questions and helping them learn about black culture. That's laughable. But the point is, of course, individual interactions can help us to grow culturally and socially. If that's not your starting point, where else are you going? How are you stretching your ideas and your concept of the world around you? As a poet, I would all day, every day argue that art, engaging with art and probing your own beliefs and ideas and where they've come from can be a great start. So I'm glad this exhibition is kind of brokering some of those conversations and I hope the conversations we're having together are doing the same thing. How does, art push our, how does art push your boundaries personally? How does it stretch you outside of the expected? And how do you value or devalue the experience of being stretched? All right, you see the number one because it's the first and tomorrow you'll check out that sticker and you will, wait, I pointed the wrong way. There we go, you'll check out that sticker and you will see the number two. Thanks for hanging out with me. Um, follow this, subscribe to the YouTube channel and you'll get notifications for these videos every day. That's an awesome way for me to, to kind of look at the impact. I'm always thinking about that. All right, talk to you later.